Hi, students. Uh, this lecture is on Chapter 7, which is the topic is Momentum. So momentum is uh, another term that finds its use in the vernacular quite a bit. But again, um, we I don't think that anybody who really uses the word momentum uh, clearly uh, or really knows what the actual definition is, or, or they're not using it in accordance with that, that definition. But in reality, momentum uh, is simple to define. And so it's literally as simple as this. If an object or system we'll just say an object for now, has a mass m and a velocity v, then it has a momentum p, for whatever reason, physicists like to use the, word, the letter p for momentum, equals mv. Okay, that's as simple as can be. That is that is a definition of momentum. And now momentum is a is actually a term or, or a concept brought out into the humanity for the first time by Sir Isaac Newton. You know, so we really have a lot of, of mechanics that we've studied so far. Much of it is attributed to Sir Isaac Newton. So Sir Isaac Newton uh, utilized momentum in the Principia. So the Principia is the great uh, work that he did in, in 1687, you know, probably, possibly the greatest work, uh, scientific work known to humanity. So what exactly you know, uh, is important about momentum? Well, we're gonna find out there's two, at least two very major things important about momentum. So uh, here's a definition. So again, as I've said, Newton and his great uh, understanding of uh, physical, in his great physical intuition, Newton introduced the concept of momentum to humanity in the Principia. And in fact, we've talked about Newton's second law so far in this class already in chapter four, but in the Principia, Newton actually did not write the second law as we wrote it in chapter four. Newton actually wrote the following. So for Newton's second law, this is what Newton wrote. He said that the sum of all forces Again, it's a system concept, is the time rate of change of the momentum. The change in momentum with respect to time. That is how he wrote the Principia, or that is how he wrote the uh, Newton's, his second law in the Principia. Now you might ask, well, why are we then why do we then get told the second law in another form in chapter four? Are, are these equivalent? I mean, why didn't you tell us about momentum? Well, again, we didn't have, we weren't ready at, we weren't ready at this point in time to actually talk about the concept of momentum. And, and again, momentum is actually a more natural variable. Isaac Newton understood that. Uh, he understood, you know, that even more natural than than mass and velocity is the concept of moment of, of momentum. But so, but the concept was not quite something you'd want to talk about in the in introductory chapters. We're talking about it here in chapter seven. Um, the other thing is, yes, momentum. Uh, this definition does agree with, um, or, or sorry, this this formulation, of Newton's second law, does agree with what we wrote in chapter four, uh, with a certain caveat. And let me uh, kind of talk about what that caveat is. All right. So let's. Uh, I'm going to erase this. Let's imagine here for a moment that I write down the sum of all forces is the time rate of change of the momentum. 
Now, momentum is a vector. We know that momentum, as I said a minute ago, is mass times velocity. Mass is a scalar. Velocity is a vector. A scalar times a vector is a vector. So momentum is a vector. It's another vector. We've seen vectors already. We have position, velocity, acceleration, force. And now we have momentum. Okay? So now I want to look at this uh, concept of momentum in a more generalized way. So let's instead say, well, let's write what, what momentum actually is. So the sum of all forces is the time rate of change of what? The uh, mass times velocity. Now, we're going to make an assumption here. I'm going to generalize the problem. I'm going to generalize the problem to say that I'm going to let mass as well as velocity would be a function of time. I'll put a little brackets here. So mass is a function of time, and velocity is always a function of time. But again, I'll just be very explicit and put functional dependencies here. We know it's, fun it's a function of time. Now, if you really want to do this correctly, you would utilize calculus You know, we avoid calculus in this class, but to really talk about this, uh, you would actually write that the sum of all forces is dp dt. And you would then write that the sum of all forces is d by dt of mv. All right. So you'd use the calculus way of writing things. And I'm off the camera here. So again, I'm just kind of putting a little calculus aside here. All right. So that's how you really would do things. Now, it turns out that if you are taking a time rate of change of a product, so I have a product here, two, two functions multiplied by each other. You have what is called a product rule. You learn about this in calculus. So in calculus, so, so product rule basically says that you take turns taking the time rate of change. So we would we would go and say, okay, let's take, let's do the time rate of change of the first function, leaving the second function alone. Of all forces, I'll take the time rate of change of the first function, delta m with respect to time, and I'll I'll leave the second function alone, the velocity. And then it's the velocity's turn. I'll leave the mass alone, again, remembering that the mass is a function of time. And I'll take the time rate of change of the velocity. It's its turn. So again, you take turns. If you have three functions multiplied together, you would take turns there. I mean, I mean, in general, if, if in calculus, let's say that h of t was, let's say, f of t times g of t, your product rule would be what? dh dt would be uh, df dt. times g left by itself plus f left by itself times dg dt. And that would be the official product rule from calculus. You have h as a function, two other functions, f and g, while you just take turns. It's f's turn to get operated on by, by the time rate of change, leaving g alone, and then now it's g's turn. So plus f and now dg dt, right? So all I'm doing is the same thing here. Now, something that's interesting here is that we already know what d delta v with respect to t is. We've seen that already. That's the acceleration. So what I can actually write is that the sum of all forces is this time rate of change of the mass function plus ma. So we see the ma. Like we did in chapter 
in chapter four, the question is, how do I make this formulation the same as this one? Well, the way to do that is to assume that the mass is a constant. If the mass is a constant, whoops, I made a mistake here. Sorry, delta m respect to t times v, and then plus ma. Sorry, I left off the t. There we go. So if I let the mass be constant, the time rate of change of a constant is zero. So that means if 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 I let if I let m be constant, it means that first term goes away. So if we assume that the mass is a constant in time. Then delta m with respect to t equals zero. Then that term, this term at this point, then goes away. And I get the summation of all forces, mass times acceleration. All right, in that case, then, then, F, which is always dp dt, or delta p with respect to t, now becomes ma. All right? So the caveat is we are assuming that the mass of the system is a constant in time. So that means that the system, as we go in time, is not gaining or losing mass. All right? So again... As I just said, Newton's second law, as written in chapter four, assumes that mass, uh, that the mass of the system is a constant. In time. All right. Now, if the mass is not a constant of time, they're going to have to understand how to express the mass as a function of time and then take that appropriate time rate of change, take that appropriate slope. Now, is this even something to worry about? Are there systems where the mass is not a fun is, is not constant? And where the mass does change in time? Well, yeah, there are. So let's ask that question. Do we really have to employ that other term that we've been ignoring before? Well, is it possible? I mean, can, are there systems where the mass is a function of time? I mean, in, in, I mean, in this case, in such cases, you cannot ignore the delta M with respect to T times V term. You can't just write F equals MA. You have to write this other term in there. But are there such systems? That's the big question. Well, I can think of about two really important ones and actually a third one that actually is in, in your life on a regular basis, right? So let's talk about, first of all, what are some examples? Well, how about a rocket? So examples of systems whose mass changes in time. One would be a rocket. I mean, a rocket, if you look at a rocket, you have a little capsule, 
and the rest of it is just a bunch of fuel. And all this fuel This is a capsule, and I mean, I'm not even drawing this to scale. Quite frankly, I mean, the capsule, the fuel will even be bigger. You know, there's a tremendous amount of energy required for, the, for a rocket to leave the Earth. Tremendous amount of energy. And so what you end up doing is you, for at, you will literally burn up majority of your mass in order to get this rocket into space. I mean, how... So I mean, as an interesting calculation, how much how much energy actually is required? I mean, what what is the, the the takeoff energy? Well, one of the ways to look at this is if you're a rocket sitting on a ship or on Earth, you have all this gravitational potential energy. You're in a radius of Earth away. Here's your rocket. Now, right now, the rocket is. You know, kinetic energy initial, you can do an energy calculation. Kinetic energy initial is zero. The rocket's sitting on, on, on the surface of the Earth. I'm trying to draw it straight up. All right, kinetic energy sitting, you know, is initially, this is the radius of the Earth, and you have a mass. You know, you have the mass of the Earth, the big M, all right? And so, and in in, initially, the potential energy... Now, what's that going to be? It's going to be mg um, r. So, it's, or it's, it's going to be, and what is m? So, really, um, it's going to be g. So, remember what, so we would think of this as mg r, right? Or r being the radius of the Earth. Remember what g is? g is capital G, capital M over r squared. So if we plug that together, we'll actually find out that the initial potential energy is actually going to be this little m, my statement for g, times r. So one of these r's cancel out, and so I actually can have the initial potential energy of g cap m little m divided by big R. Not an R squared like in Newton's law of gravitation, but I'm gonna divide by one R. There's actually a negative sign I, you know, that I have to worry about, but I'm not gonna worry about that right now. Um, but anyway, that's my initial situation. Initially, the rocket's not moving. Finally, the rocket, or initially the rocket has this much. Now, we're gonna assume that the rocket is gonna go so far away that the potential energy will basically be zero. And at this point, the kinetic energy final will be some one half m b squared. That v is gonna be the escape velocity of the rocket or any body, honestly. And your final potential energy when you're considered going at infinity will be zero. We'll consider this at infinity. So what happens here? Conservation of energy. Okay. What's it going to be? Well, kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial is kinetic energy final plus potential energy final. Well, a couple of these are zeros, which is nice. Kinetic energy initial, the rocket's sitting initially at rest before it starts taking off, and potential energy final is zero. So what I got to do is I got to balance out two things. I got to balance out G cap M little m over R not r squared, but r, it's energy this time, equals one half little m v squared. I cancel out the little m's, and I find out that I get this special speed. Put the two across here, two cap g cap m over r. Take the square root. What is that speed? That's the escape velocity of an object from a planet. All right, let's figure out what that is. Let's put that, let's put some numbers in. Okay, and it's just a simple conservation of energy calculation, but it, it'll, it'll tell you a reason why you have to have such a ridiculously large amount of fuel to get a rocket up. So again, this is escape velocity. So V is 2G cap M over 
r square root escape velocity. So how fast do you have to, how, how much kinetic energy does something have to have to escape the Earth? V, 2, universal gravitation constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Uh, mass of the Earth, 5.98 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. And I'm going to divide by R. So I'm going to erase this formula here. Divide by R. Look this up. Your R for the Earth is 6.37. This is the radius of the Earth times 10 to the 6 meters. Again, universal gravitation constant, mass of the Earth, radius of the Earth. Don't forget to put the square root on everything. And I'll just put it in my calculator right now. Let's see what we get. 6.67, 10 to the negative 11. Uh, times 2. Um, times 5.98, 10 to the 24th, divided by 6.37, 10 to the 6th. Take the square root of that. 1.12 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 10 to the 4th meters per second, otherwise known as, it's kind of a famous, I usually remember it's 11.3. But 11, and I probably just am not doing careful enough numbers. It's 11.3 kilometers per second. Okay, 11.3 kilometers per second is how much velocity you have to apply to anything to get it off the ground, to get it into space. That is why your rocket has got to pretty much sacrifice most of its weight in terms of fuel to get any kind of a capsule in space. 11.3 kilometers per second. All right. So again, yeah, you're 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 gonna you're gonna have a you're gonna have a um, you're gonna have a uh, rocket that's gonna be a majority of it's just gonna be flat out fuel. Another example is a missile. A missile essentially is on a suicide mission, right? So essentially it eats its own self in order to get, let's say, a warhead. And this is all fuel. It literally eats its own self up. And by the time it reaches its target, most part what's left is a warhead. Okay, and so the missile, missile, constantly losing mass. Okay, constantly losing mass, very large. So, so missiles, missiles and rockets. Rockets and missiles have a significant delta M with respect to T function. Um, yeah, it's a... Uh, um, influence, I guess I should say. You can't just say that variable is so small, don't worry about it. But even in your day-to-day -day life, you drive a car, right? And you think about it for a moment, you know, I'll just kind of imagine here. I, um, I fill up my car. which holds 20 gallons of gas, roughly. Well, I do my lawn, and one of the things that, you know, I've, ever so often I have to go and fill up my, my two-gallon gas can. You know, and I'm a pretty big guy. I mean, it's, it's you know, not like it's too heavy for me to carry my gas can, but you know, it is, it is a relatively non-trivial weight to carry the two gallon gas can. And that's full of gas. Imagine 10 times that. You stick that in your car, and then you imagine you're just driving around, and eventually, you know, if you're like me, you drive around to the car's almost on empty, then you go to the gas station, right? And so for some, somehow, some way, as I'm just driving around doing my thing, um, I'm going through it, I'm burning up all this mass of gas, which is not, not trivial. 
So my car has a smaller, and so does yours, has a small delta M over delta T presence. Now it's small enough for, for most, for, for, for most uh, problems where you're talking about going from point A to point B, you can pretty much ignore it. But it is, it is not zero. All right, and so, so, you know, so again, in general, yes, there is that term. And we, and we can't just always ignore it. And in some cases, like in the case of, you know, of, of a rocket or a missile, you really can't ignore it. All right, now, what's another reason why momentum is important? Or actually, let me, before I go on, let me do a, at least a, a problem here. I'm going to do open stats. Now, again, we are one chapter off between uh, our book and open stacks. If we we're in open stacks right now, we would already we would already be on chapter eight. All right. We in where we are right now are in chapter seven of Cutting on Johnson. Don't let these numbers throw you off. I'm I'm talking open stacks here. So here's an open stacks problem. So let's uh let's um. Uh, just get our feet wet with momentum. So calculate, the, so A, calculate the momentum. Uh, of a 2000 kilogram elephant. Charging a hunter at a speed of 7.50 meters per second. <clears throat> okay, B. Compare the elephant's momentum uh, with the momentum of a uh, 0 0.0400 kilogram tranquilizer dart. Fired at a speed of 600 meters per second. C, what is the momentum of the 90 kilogram hunter? Running. at 7.40 meters per second after missing the elephant. So he's in trouble. All right, so here we go. A, so A, calculate the, so we're starting first problem of the of the chapter. Calculate the momentum of a two thousand kilogram elephant charging a, a hunter at a speed of seven point five zero meters per second. B. Compare the elephant's momentum with the momentum of a zero point zero four zero zero kilogram tranquilizer dart fired at a speed of six hundred meters per second. And finally, C. What is the momentum of the ninety kilogram hunter running at a seven point four zero meters per second uh, at after missing the elephant? All right. So again, a lot of information up there. I'm going to erase it. It's a pretty simple problem. We're, again, we're just getting our feet wet with a new concept, and we're just going to consider one dimension. Really, momentum, as we know, is a is a vector, so it could have multiple dimensions. We'll talk more about that in a moment. 
So um, what do I need to write down? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll let little E be el represent elephant. And what do we know? 2,000 kilograms is the mass of the elephant. The speed of the elephant is 7.50 meters per second. Elephant again. I'll use D for dart. M sub D, mass of the dart, it's a very small mass, 0 0.0400 kilograms, that's the dart. The speed of the dart is 600 meters per second. And finally, we have the hunter, I'll use H for hunter, M sub H for hunter, uh, 90 kilograms, hunter. And the speed of the hunter is 7.40 meters per second. He's not going quite as fast as the elephant. It's not good for him. All right. So let's do the calculations. I'm going to erase this, writing down what our numbers are. All right. So we'll do the momentum of the elephant, part A. P sub E is M sub E, V sub E. Simple as that. P sub E, mass of the uh, elephant, 2,000 kilograms. The speed of the elephant, 7.50 meters per second. And we find out that the momentum of the elephant will be 15,000 kilograms meters per second. That is, those are the units of momentum. When you see that combination, there's no special physicist that we honor with that combination unit. So the units of momentum are simply just kilograms meters per second. Okay, we don't have any special physicist to honor. All right, uh, P, let's do the dart. The momentum of the dart, P sub D, is the mass of the dart, Speed of the dart. Okay, again, mass of dart 0 0.04, 0, 0 kilograms times 600 meters per second. The momentum of the dart will be, let's multiply it together, 24 kilograms meters per second. Okay, seems pretty easy so far. And I'm now gonna I'm now gonna do the hunter. I'm gonna erase this. Hunter. So momentum of the hunter. Mass of the hunter, speed of the hunter, or velocity of the hunter, it should be. That's all in one dimension. Momentum of the hunter. The mass of the hunter is 90 kilograms. And he is running at 7.40 meters per second. The momentum of the hunter is going to be 666 kilograms meters per second. All right. So again, these are the uh, various momenta. You know, again, this is these are really it's really a vector um, problem. We're just doing a one dimension. We're assuming that the the hunter and the elephant are moving along in one dimension and the dart's being shot in one dimension. Okay, that's kind of more or less what we're what we're assuming here. Because this really is not supposed to be a speed. It happens to be a speed here because we're considered we're doing a simplified one-dimensional problem. Okay. Now, next um, thing we want to talk about is we kind of want to relate the momentum now back to force. And so when, you know, you see this oftentimes in very fast collisions. We, and the next, next concept we're going to talk about is called impulse. You see this usually in very fast collisions. Is that the you have an object that comes, you know, let's say, for instance, like a baseball hitting a, a, a bat hitting a baseball. You notice that, you know, before... You know, here's the baseball coming at the bat.
you know, and the bat's swinging. And then afterwards, I mean, and then right at, now at the collision for a very short time, the ball is connecting with the bat. And often, sometimes, you know, if it, you're talking about some really, really strong power hitter in baseball, the ball is actually even deformed for a moment. You see the ball and the bat are right with each other at the moment of collision. Then afterwards, the ball goes back the other direction. Now the ball is screaming back away, and then the bat's just finishing its swing. So, you know, it's already hit the ball, and it's, you know, the batter's finishing a swing with it. So for a very, and this is usually very small delta T. We're talking milliseconds. All this happens. So you all of a sudden you have a lot of momentum going one way, crack, a whole bunch of momentum going the other direction, right? So this is called impulse. The actual time of collision, very, very small amount of time of the collision is the impulse. How long does that collision occur? You know, how, you know, the actual moment of collision. We talk about typical in momentum problems, we talk about the before and the after. With impulse, we want to talk about what's actually happening at the time of collision. Okay? So what you do, so impulse, we want to talk about what's happening at the time of collision. So, you know, we're considering... The very small delta T at the impact of collision. So we go to Newton's second law. We say, well, what's Newton's second law again? Well, sum of all forces is mass times, well, actually. Delta P with respect to T. I'm going to do a one dimension for right now. Simplify the math. And when you sum up a bunch of forces, you get what's called a net force or the resultant force, right? So we can actually write this as a net force. But the forces are typically complicated at the time of, 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 uh, of the collision. So generally speaking, you know, at the at the collision, or during the collision, I should say, the force is hard to characterize. It's a difficult. To characterize all right and so so we use an average force call it F over bar or F bar all right and so instead I'll write F bar here F bar is delta P with respect to T. This is an average force. The average force during the moment of collision, during this very brief moment. All right, so we're gonna just simplify, simply uh, um, solve this problem real quick. I'll, I'm gonna reorganize things a little bit. And I'm just going to write the following. I'm just going to say that delta P is just F bar delta T. That's all it is. I mean, I'm just cross multiplying F bar. What you see, so on one side, you see that like the baseball, you see this change in momentum. You know, it has a mass times velocity going one way, it suddenly has a mass times velocity going the other way. That's caused by this F, this, this actual 
force that's occurring at the time of collision, the time of impact. This right-hand side is what we refer to as the, the mathematical uh, uh, expression of the impulse. Is the very is the average force over a very a very large force usually over a very small amount of time that is what causes this change in the momentum. That is called the impulse. Typically, very very fast, very short lived. So let me give an example of a of an impulse. I'm gonna look at problem eight point seven from OpenStax. Okay. Open stacks, 8.7. That says a bullet is accelerated down the barrel of a gun. by hot gases uh, produced in the combustion of gunpowder. What is the average force exerted on a zero point zero three zero zero kilogram bullet? to accelerate it to a speed of 600 meters per second in a time of 2.00 milliseconds. So again, a bullet is accelerated down the barrel of a gun by hot gases produced in the combustion of gunpowder. What is the average force exerted on a 0 0.0300 kilogram bullet to accelerate it to a speed of 600 meters per second in a time of 2.00 milliseconds? So again, this is, a, a, this is, like, this is like the uh, bat hitting the baseball. Here, initially, the bullet is at rest, has no reason to move. Then you have this, this chemical reaction caused by the burning of gunpowder that causes this exothermic reaction that essentially blows the bullet out. So the bullet now goes from having no initial momentum now to a very large momentum caused by this explosion. This is, a, this is an impulse, a change in momentum caused by what? Caused by an impulse, an average force over a small amount of time. Okay, it's very similar to... The, uh, the baseball getting hit by the bat. All right, so let's uh, erase this. So what's our equation? Well, impulse, so we have delta P is F bar delta T. Okay, so this is an impulse problem. Okay, so what do we know? Well, we, we want to find the average force. That's what we're asked, asked to do, right? So let's solve for the average force. So F bar is going to look a lot like Newton's second law of motion. Delta P with respect to T. 
Well, that's going to be what? That's going to be delta. We know what the mass of the bullet is, and we and we know what speed it's going to have, or delta um, delta of mv, sorry, with respect to time. We assume the bullet is totally indestructible. That means its mass will not change. That means its mass is a constant. So I can pull the mass out. F bar is m delta v over delta t. Or the average force is what? The mass, we have v minus v naught, change in velocity. Here's the velocity where the bullet, you know, is coming, going out of the gun, uh, out of the uh, chamber or out, out of the barrel. Here's, it's initially at rest over delta t. And so we know that the bullet's initially at rest, so it has a v naught of zero. So what's it going to be? Well, my average force at this point is mv over delta t. My average force is the mass of the bullet, 0 0.0300 kilograms times 600 meters per second divided by the small amount of time. Again, you want to write an SI. You don't, write, you don't just want to write 2.00. You want 2.00, it's milliseconds, right? So times 10 to the negative three seconds. When I do all of this, I find out that that average force exerted by the reaction is pretty large. It's 9.0 times 10 to the third newtons, 9,000 newtons is the, pow is the force that, the average force that that bullet experiences by the, by the gunpowder. Uh, gunpowder reaction. And it's over a very, very short time. Okay, that's the concept of impulse. So now, I kind of said there's a couple of major reasons why momentum is important. First of all, it truly is what is in inside of Newton's second law. So Newton's second law is a law that involves momentum in the most natural way. That's one reason why momentum is important. Now, we're going to find out here that momentum is also conserved. So the next topic is going to be the conservation of momentum. All right. So... Let me start off by a simple example. So imagine I have two, we'll say billiard balls or pool balls, right? So I have, you know, I have a kind of my, my example here. I have, we'll say before, I have ball one coming toward ball two. You know, and, um, and we'll say that this ball has a V1I. I stands for initial. And this ball, any variable subtracted to this ball will be V2I. I is just a word for a, a letter that represents initial. Okay, they haven't banged into each other yet. So at the moment of collision, These two balls are now um, connected to one another. Here's ball one, here's ball two. This is at, at the moment of collision. And ball one feels a force due to ball two. So ball one's gonna feel a force F12. The force on one due to ball two. Likewise, ball two represents is um, experiences F two one. The force on two due to ball one. This is at the collision. So F one two force on ball one due to ball two. F21 force 
on ball two due to ball one. Finally, after the collision's over, what we fully expect to happen is that ball one goes off to the left. We'll have it'll be at a V1F, and ball two goes off to the right, and it'll have a V2F. F stands for final. All right, so two balls come together. So it's like billiard balls. They come together, ball one, ball two. Initial velocity of ball one. Again, we're going to do a one-dimensional problem to simplify everything. So these are velocities. There's just a one dimension. Ball one is heading toward ball two. Ball one has a V1I initial velocity. Ball, ball two has a V2I initial velocity. They collide at the moment of collision. Ball one feels a force because of ball two. It feels a force F12. Force on ball one due to ball two. Ball two, in its perspective, feels a force F21. Force on ball two due to ball one. All right. And then afterwards, and I should, I should write after. After, yeah, you know, before and after. Ball one goes off to the left at a, at a, at a final velocity V1F. Ball two goes off to the right at a final velocity V2F. F stands for final. Okay, so that's what's going on here. Now let's analyze the problem. So we see that, oh, I'm gonna erase this now. Let's kind of focus on the moment of collision for a moment, you know, just for a second. So at the collision, um, so we know that um, ball one will experience some sort of an impulse given by F12 delta T, right? So ball one is going to, if you look, look at my picture mathematically, there's get, ball one will experience a change in the momentum, delta P1, because of the force it felt due to ball two, in a time delta T, very short time. Likewise, in ball two's perspective, delta P2 will equal F21 with the same delta T. They both are in contact with the same amount of time. All right, so the thing is now is that um, I can solve now these two equations and say, okay, well, I got F12 is delta P1 over delta T and F21 is delta P2 over delta T. So far, so good. Now, here's, here's the important uh, concept here. Newton's third law. states that F12 and F21 are action, are an action re, or form, I should say, an action reaction couple. Remember Newton's third law. Every action is an equal and opposite reaction. Basically, I push on a wall with a force F. The wall pushes back on me with an equal and opposite force F. That means that F12 is negative F21 because of Newton's third law. Well, let's employ that. So if that's the case, that means... F12 equals negative uh, F21. That means that I can write that 
that delta P1, so again, if F12, F12 equals negative F21 implies that I can write that delta P1 over delta T, I'm substituting that in for F12, is going to equal negative delta P2 with respect to T. I'm substituting this in for F21. I can say this because of Newton's third law. Now, the delta t's are the same, you know, for each for on each side. So I can I can actually cancel out the delta t's, and I can write that delta p one is negative delta p two. All right, let's kind of go back up here now. If I can say that, then what does this mean? Delta P1 is what? P, P1 final minus P1 initial. The change that ball one feels. Initially had this momentum. Now it has this momentum. And that's equal to negative change in momentum ball two. P2 final minus P2 initial. Now let's rearrange this a little bit. I'll multiply through the negative sign. P1 final minus P1 initial is negative P2 final minus P plus, sorry, plus, because a negative sign, P2 initial. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to put all the finals on one side, initials on the other side, and I can write the following. P1 initial plus P2 initial equals P1 final plus P2 final equals constant momentum. If I take the total momentum of a system before you know, say at some given time, or maybe before the collision, I add them all up. And then after, at a later time, or maybe after the collision, after an event, I now add up all the momentum in the system afterwards. I will always add up to the same constant total momentum. This is the conservation of momentum. Okay, so the total momentum or momenta, if I want to be plural here, it's not momentums, it's momenta, the total momenta of all objects in a system at an initial time is equal to, actually, let me just rewrite this up here. I think it's important enough to state it in its own right. The total momentum of all objects in a system an initial time is equal to the total momenta of all objects in a system at a later time Given that the system is isolated, I 
Isolate, a very important word. That means the net force, or i.e. the net force on the system is zero. You must have an isolated system. You know, whatever forces are going on in the system is fine as long as if you define a system, the total net force, all the forces that may happen to operate on your system externally, all of them must add to zero. That turns out to be a very, very easy uh, um, thing to accomplish. The important thing is if you add up all the momentum of your bodies before, let's, at some given time, let's say before a collision, it adds up to the total momenta afterwards. Now, that does not say that the momentum of any given body is conserved. The momentum of the bodies that actually make up the collision will indeed change. What it tells you is if you add up all the momenta of the bodies before the collision, it is the same as all the, the sum of all the momenta of the bodies after the collision. It says nothing about an individual body. It is a system concept. It is the sum of all the momenta of the bodies before a collision must equal the sum of all the momenta of the bodies in your system after the collision, provided again that the system is isolated. <clears throat> now, what's interesting is this is a very uh, easily applicable and universally applicable conservation principle. Now, you might say to yourself, wait a minute. You told me back, you told us back in chapter six that we now have all of the laws of physics for mechanics. Wouldn't this conservation of momentum be one of those laws of physics? Well, the answer to that is actually no. So again, momentum conservation, remember, a law of physics. So the conservation of momentum is not a law of physics. The conservation of momentum is certainly is a conservation principle, no doubt about that. But it is not a law of physics. Why is that? Well, what is a law of physics again? A law of physics is a behavior. Of the universe. That is always true. but does not have a more primary cause. Okay, what's wrong with, you know, so if I ask you, conservation of energy, the universe, for whatever reason, conserves energy. Uh, you know, this number, that we can calculate and then later, you know, calculate it again is the same. Why, why is that so? If I were to ask the why question, the answer is nobody knows. Why is Newton's second law? That's always true. Nobody knows. If I were to ask the question, why is the conservation of momentum? The answer to that is Newton's third law. Remember, we had to employ Newton's third law in order to obtain the conservation of momentum. So if I were to ask, why is the conservation of momentum? The answer is Newton's third law. If I were to next ask, why is Newton's third law? Then the, you know, the answer to that is nobody knows, right? So the answer really is the conservation of momentum depends on Newton's third law.
That's why it is not a law of physics in and of itself. So the conservation of momentum depends. You can look back in your derivation on Newton's third law. So it is not a law of physics in its own right, even though it's way more generally applicable than conservation of energy. And just when you're talking about the theory, I have not just added another law of physics to the theory. Now, the theory only has the three laws of motion and the conservation of energy. The conservation of momentum uh, is because of Newton's third law. It is not a uh, law of physics in and of its own right. So, you know, make sure that's clear. Um, but it's extremely applicable. Much more applicable. And nice thing about momentum is you don't have, it doesn't leak. There's not different kinds of momentum. Like there's different, all these different kinds of energy. No, momentum is just momentum. And generally speaking, even, even the low, you know, the suboptimal quality uh, equipment we have at, at college, you can still very easily uh, verify the controversial momentum principle. It is a very easy to verify, very applicable, very useful, general, generally applicable and useful uh, uh, principle to apply in physics. You know, controversial momentum, uh, controversial energy is very hard to apply, at least for mechanical systems. We'll find out that it's much easier to apply, let's say, for, for thermal systems or atomic systems, but not so much for mechanical systems. There's too many ways energy can escape. All right, so let's kind of do an example here of, um, of momentum conservation. Now, think about momentum conservation. It seems like an easy concept. If I add up all the momentum of bodies before a collision, it's equal to all momentum of all the bodies after a collision. Very easy concept to state. Turns out it's going to be mathematically a pain. So there's no free lunch. Sometimes it's an easy concept. You, you pay your dues in the, the mathematics. Thermal physics, you'll realize you have some concepts that are a little deeper, a little more abstract, but the mathematics is easier. All right, and so and there's no free lunch again. So uh, let's look at OpenStax 8.23. All right, so that one says train cars are coupled together. By being bumped into one another. That's how you, you know, you see a lot of this in Fort Worth. We have a lot of trains here. By being bumped into one another. Suppose two loaded train cars. are moving toward one another. The first having a mass of 150,000 kilograms. And a velocity of 0 0.300 meters per second.
And the second having a mass. of 110,000 kilograms. And a velocity of negative 0 0.120 meters per second. And a negative, this means it's going the other direction. It's on the other side, I guess. What is their final velocity? Okay, so Alpha Stacks 8.23. Train cars are coupled together by being bumped into one another. Those two, lo two loaded train cars are moving toward one another. The first having a mass of 150,000 kilograms and a velocity of 0 0.300 meters per second. And the second having a mass of 110,000 kilograms and a velocity of negative 0 0.120 meters per second. What is their final velocity? Okay, so I'm gonna start doing some momentum problems. I mean, momentum problems are typically we We'll, we'll uh, study uh, collision problems, things colliding together, okay? So, so if you go, you know, if we live in a, in a city, in an area that is, uh, has a very large presence of uh, railroad industry. So you see a lot of trains. Uh, so I have two, so I'm gonna write down, you know, my, my, um, my parameters here. So I have car one, I'll have mass one, M1. 150,000 kilograms. Okay, uh, it has a it has a velocity. Now again, we're talking velocity, not speed. It's a one-dimensional problem. We're, I mean, momentum again is a velocity uh, concept. I'm sorry, no, velocity. It is a vector concept. So 0 0.300 meters per second. Now we'll, I'll put a little plus here just to kind of you know, be deliberate, but again, it there's definitely a direction to that number. Uh, the other train car, mass two, 110,000 kilograms, and it's going the other way. It's it's coming. It's so if a uh, train car one is heading to the right, train car two is heading to the left. V two, negative 0 0.120 meters per second. So what's going to happen? Well, we have we always typically will have a before and an after picture. So before and after. Well, before we have two bodies. Okay. So before we'll call it P sub I. The total initial momentum of the problem. We're going to sum them all up. We have the momentum for the first one, M1 V1. So I'll use little v. And the momentum of the second one, m2, v2. Add the momentum of the first body plus the momentum of the second body. Total momentum, not the momentum of any individual body, but the total momentum is what is conserved. Okay, so again, I want to calculate the total momentum. Afterwards, while well, piece of f, I'm assuming that the two bodies now stick together and move as one. So now they all move as a single mass, m1 plus m2, and they'll move at a constant v. So again, what do I have initially? You know, here's my positive, uh, I'll see positive x negative, uh, no, I'll see plus and minus, and we need to even have x. Uh, initially, I have m1 going at little v1. And I have M2 going at little v2. Now afterwards, afterwards, 
Okay, I'm going to make the assumption that they both move together to the right. If I'm wrong, that's fine. It'll, it'll just mean that I have an opposite sign. So afterwards, I have one mass. One mass. We'll say it's M1 plus M2. Moving together. And we'll say they move together at a capital V. That's what's going on. My before picture, I add up the momentum of body one plus the momentum of body two. All the bodies in the system in the first picture, add them all up. In the second picture, the after picture, I only have one body now because they're crunched together, they're bumped together as a single moving entity. They're going to move together with one, with one final velocity, which I'll use as capital V. That's what's going on in the problem. And what I want to know is I'm going to employ, employ the conservation of momentum. which is going to tell me that P sub I is equal to P sub F. The total momentum before it, the collision is equal to the total momentum after the collision. That is the conservation of momentum. That is what is conserved. Okay? That's what, that's, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to basically connect these two together. So um, I'm going to erase part of this. So, P sub I equals P sub F. So, this stuff, M1, V1, plus M2, V2, is M1 plus M2 times capital V. I want to solve for capital V. Because I want to, because it says, what's the final velocity? Well, that's capital V. So, I'm going to erase the rest of this stuff. So, remember... If the velocity is positive, it's moving to the right in my picture. And this negative is going to the left. That was the orientation I established. All I got to do is just divide. I'm going I'm to flip it about the equal sign and divide by m1 plus m2. So doing a couple steps of algebra one, my capital V is going to be nothing more than m1 v1 plus m2 v2 all divided by the sum m1 plus m2. Okay, I work all that out. I'll find out what that final is, uh, velocity is. So let's do it. Plug in the numbers. I have the initial mass, M1, is um, going to be 150,000 kilograms. Uh, V1, remember, is a positive 0 0.300 meters. Let's move it over. These are big numbers. Capital V, again, M1, 150,000 kilograms times 0 0.300 meters per second plus 110,000 kilograms times negative 0 0.120 meters per second. And that's all going to, uh, that's all going to be divided by, well, I'm off the board again. These numbers are so big. I'm going to go way off to the left here. All right. Okay, 150,000 kilograms times 0 0.300 meters per second plus 110,000 kilograms times negative 0 0.120 meters per second. Barely made it. Uh, all divided by the sum of the masses, 150,000 kilograms plus 110,000 kilograms. And I do all this, I find out that V is going to be 0 0.122 meters per second. Now it's going to be positive. You know, there is actually a sign here. One way of looking at this too is that the total co combination is going to is going to move at 0 0.122 meters per second in the direction and in the initial direction of car one. I can look at it that way too. I happen to call that positive, but really it's 
if I wrote, if I did the problem backwards, it would just be again, it would be in the in the direction that a car one was initially moving. All right, so that is a one-dimensional collision problem. Now the question is, is energy conserved? This is a little extra addendum I put on here. So you notice that you can always apply the conservation of momentum. That is almost ubiquitously applied. The question is, can I actually conserve energy? So how would that work? Well, what would I do? Well, the um, and I would try to do the conservation of energy. I'm just, again, this is a little extra to see if it's conserved. So let's look at conservation of energy. In general, again, I'm talking about a flat surface, right? So in general, I can, you know, in my potential energy, I can, I can say, I can say, I can say kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial equals kinetic energy final plus potential energy final. Again, I'm looking at the conservation of mechanical energy. Now, if I define, if I have these cars going along, let's say they're rolling along here, M1 and here's M2, well, they're actually both, I can define the ground, I can define this as the zero of potential energy. Right, and so if I do that, if I have a flat surface and all of the bodies happen to move, ha happen to be moving at the same level, same height, then I can define that height as my zero potential. That means I don't have to worry about these terms. I can define them as zero. It doesn't mean they go away, but generally speaking, when I apply the conservation of energy, I really, when in situations where I'm just doing collisions, like a billiard balls on a, or pool balls on a pool table or, or you know, objects that are, that are at the same height, I don't have to worry about potential energy. So when I'm, when I'm applying the conservation of energy, I'm only going to employ kinetic energy. There is no such thing as a conservation of kinetic energy. It is a conservation of mechanical energy. It just so happens that in these particular scenarios, I can ignore potential energy because the entire system is operating on a flat um, uh, surface that happens to have the same height with respect to one another. All right. So what that means then is I, I want to add up all kinetic energies of the system of all bodies before the collision. What is that? Well, that's going to be one half m one v one squared plus one half m two v two squared. That's the before picture. What do I have energy wise afterwards? I have one half total mass m one plus m two times a big B squared. So again, all the objects of the system beforehand. Car one has a mass one has energy one half m one v one squared plus car two one half m two v two squared. They add up their energies. They just add up as scalars. That's what's nice about energies. Afterward, one half. What's the mass? The total mass. They're lump, they're hunk, they're um, bumped together. M one plus m two times what squared? Well, v squared. The the speed in which they move together. Again, nice thing about energies, unlike momentum, momentum is a vector quantity, which is a pain to go and add together. Well, I'll talk more about that in a moment. But energies are scalars. All right, so let's just see if this works. Is energy conserved? So let's just kind of so let's just kind of look at this and, and see if that's the case. So I'm gonna just this the I'm I'm gonna kind of do things a little bit differently. So I want to look at the kinetic energy initial, kinetic energy final by itself. So kinetic energy initial. Let's see, what, what, what would we have? 
one half m1 v1 squared plus one half m2 v2 squared. All right. Kinetic energy initial. I'd have one half the 150,000 kilograms times 0 0.300 meters per second squared plus one half the 110,000 kilograms write it down here, plus one half the 110,000 kilograms times negative 0 0.120 meters per second quantity squared. If I add these all up, I find out that my total kinetic energy, which maybe my total energy in this case, because potential energy can, can be considered zero, my kinetic energy before, if I add these all up, I will find out the kinetic energy before is 7,542 joules. Adding up the kinetic energy from car one and car two. What about afterwards? Afterwards, I have kinetic energy final. That's one half total mass, M1 plus M2 times final speed squared. Kinetic energy final, I have one half, 150,000 kilograms plus 110,000 kilograms times 0 0.122 meters per second squared. I find out that the kinetic energy final is going to be 1,935 joules. Clearly not conserved. What percentage do I lose? So, so again, let me kind of write these numbers next to each other. So kinetic energy final is 1,935 joules. All right, so now, so clearly energy or mechanical energy is not conserved. Percent loss. So energy loss would be what? Well, it would be kinetic energy initial minus kinetic energy final divided by kinetic energy initial all multiplied by 100%. Percent energy loss it would be uh, 75.42 joules. Minus 1935 joules divided by 7542 joules. And joules over joules, I have a unitless number as I should. Multiply by 100%. I find out that the percent energy loss is going to be a whopping 74%. That means not only do I lose energy, I lose the majority of the energy when these two these two cars collide. That energy, some of it is, you know, goes off as mechanical energy, clearly because the cars are still moving. But you'll hear the big bang, you know, all that sound energy. You hear the, you know, there's frictional energy, there's heat, there's vibrations of the of, of the metal. There is a lot of energy that is flat out lost. It goes somewhere, you know, kind of like my initial example of the Chuck E. Cheese game tokens, right? You know, I should have had, instead of you losing the first 20 tokens, I should have had you lose the first 74. Because, again, you know, you are, most of the energy gets lost. That's the reason for me, you know, and I, and I was telling you, how, you know, losing the tokens. Well, that's, that's what I'm talking about. If you look carefully enough, you'll find the energy. 
but it's definitely not a mechanical energy. It's from non-conservative work. All right, so in this particular situation, there's no way that the conservation of energy is going to tell me anything. However, the conservation of momentum will always tell me something, whether I have non-conservative work being done or not, or, or if it's all conservative. Okay, so even though the conservation of momentum is, a, is not really in the same theoretical footing as the conservation of energy, it is by far much more applicable, much more useful. All right, this takes us to the concept of what are called elastic collisions. All right, so we now talk, we're now going to talk about different kinds of collisions. So one kind of collision is called elastic. Can an elastic collision um, is one that conserves internal energy? One that conserves internal energy. We'll say internal kinetic energy, I guess. Even though it's there is no conservation of kinetic energy, as well as momentum. The internal, the total internal kinetic energy. Right, um, is the sum of kinetic energies of the objects in the system. Okay, that more or less, if I were to do the conservation of energy calculation I just did before, you'd find out that they balance in an, in an elastic collision, all right? You know, most systems though, in general, an elastic collision is a, an idealization. They don't really exist. Typically, what people will use as a good example of an elastic collision are two bang, banging together pool balls, right? So you take a, you know, a, let's say a, a pool ball hitting another pool ball. Well, the fact is, though, sure, you, you know, a relatively small amount of energy is lost in that collision. However, if I were to, if you were to walk into a pool, a pool hall or a bar, and you heard that particular sound of a pool ball click clacking into another, or, or if I were to play a sound bite for you right now, you'd recognize it immediately. So the very fact that you can actually recognize and hear the characteristic sound of two uh, clacking together uh, pool balls means that there is sound energy given off. If there's sound energy given off, that means the energy is being lost, even if it's a small amount. All right, so... So again, this is kind of an idealization, all right? So the, again, um, the best way to do this is to give, you know, kind of show it by an example. So I'm, so this is what an, el an elastic collision is. Again, it's, it conserves internal energy, internal kinetic energy as well as momentum. Total internal energy is literally the sum of the kinetic energies of all objects in the system. Okay, that's called an, an elastic collision. So let me give an example of one. And I will go to, let's just remind ourselves what we're doing again. Again, we're staying in one dimension for now. And you'll see why that's a good thing in a little bit. In a little bit. Uh, I'm going to look at OpenStax uh, 8.30. All 
Uh, that one says a 70.0 kilogram ice hockey goalie. Originally at rest. Uh, catches a zero point one five zero kilogram hockey puck. Slapped at him at a velocity of 35.0 meters per second. Suppose the goalie and the ice puck have an elastic collision. And the puck is reflected back in the direction from which it came. Okay. Um, what will be what will their final velocities be in this case? Okay, um, Opus X 8.30. A 70.0 kilogram ice hockey goalie, originally at rest. He's the guy that defends the, uh, you know, the goal, the, the net, okay? Uh, catches a 0 0.150 kilogram hockey puck, slapped at him at, at a velocity of 35.0 meters per second. Suppose that the goalie and the ice puck have an elastic collision, and the puck is reflected back in the direction from which it came. What will be their final velocity? So essentially, the we can kind of consider the goalie is a big mass. The puck is going to essentially bounce off the goalie. The goalie is going to have a final velocity, and the puck will have a final velocity. All right. So and the puck is and the goalie is initially at rest. What we have to do is we have to establish a um, uh, an orientation in this problem. So let me erase this. So um, imagine that my before picture, I have a big goalie, and I'm just going to make him a, you know, big mass, big M, right? And his, his uh, initial velocity, I'll, I'll use big variables for that, we'll say his V0 is zero. Now I'm going to use big, var big variables for the goalie, little variables for the puck. The puck is coming in. And the puck has a little mass, little m, and it's coming in at v, I'll, I'll use little letters for the puck, we'll say little v naught. 
Okay, that's the before picture. They haven't collided yet. They're going to collide, smack. Afterwards, well, I'm, I'm going to expect, I mean, I don't know, but I'm going to expect the goalie is going to probably re recoil a little bit. We'll say he'll have a, a final velocity, capital V, and the puck. My expectation is a puck will, will come back and bounce. Well, it's, we're being told it comes back from which it came. So the puck is going to come back oops, and go from the direction which it came. I'm going to assume here that my coordinate system, my orientation that I'm assuming is positive to the right, negative to the left. So if the if something's moving to the left, it's a negative velocity. If something's moving to the right, it's a positive velocity. So what is so what what do I you know what do I get from my you know in the uh, in my um, uh, uh, translation here? So of the of the English the mathematics. Well, my capital M, we're told a seventy point zero kilograms. That is the mass of the goalie. Okay. Uh, Initial capital V naught, goalie is initially at rest, zero. Capital V, we don't know what the, what the final velocity of the goalie is. That's what we're being told to find. How about the puck? Little m for the puck, small mass, 0 0.150 kilograms. We're told that in the, in the literature as well. The initial velocity of the puck, okay, it's coming toward the goalie. In my orientation, I'm calling that negative. So I'll say that's negative 35.0 meters per second. Again, uh, momentum is a is a vector. You must consider plus and minus in this particular one-dimensional case. You need to do magnitude and direction. And what's the final velocity of the goalie? I'll say little, oh sorry, the puck, little v. I don't know that either. Now, all right, so that's this is what this is the situation that I'm in. All right, so I, I already go and apply conservation of momentum. Well, what would happen? I'm going to erase this stuff. Let's apply the conservation of momentum. I can always do that. The conservation of momentum. So what do I know? Total momentum before. Well, I have um, mass of the goalie plus initial velocity of the goalie plus the mass of the puck, initial velocity of the puck is equal to the mass of the goalie times the final velocity of the goalie plus the mass of the puck, final velocity of the puck. Total momentum before for all objects in the problem is the total momentum after. Now, what's nice is the initial velocity of the goalie is zero, so I don't have that particular situation. So really, my conservation of um, momentum gives me little m, little v naught is big M, big V plus little m, little v. Well, I'm in trouble, right? Because I only have one equation, yet I have two unknowns. I want to find the final velocity of the of the goalie. I also want to find the final the final velocity of the puck. So I have two unknowns and I have one equation. So unless I get something else, I can't do the problem. But wait a minute, we're told that the collision is elastic. That means that I actually can use the conservation of energy. So nice, elastic collision. So it means energy is conserved. It means I have a second equation. It means I can do the problem. Great. And you can only use conservation of energy in elastic collisions all right that means that i can write down uh you know 
total kinetic energy of the goalie before plus the total kinetic energy of the puck before is equal to the total kinetic energy of the goalie afterwards plus the total plus the kinetic energy of the puck afterwards and again the goalie was at rest so there is no kinetic energy for the goalie and i can cancel out all these one halves as well and so i actually have a second equation and that is m little v naught squared is big v big that's uh, a big m big v squared plus little m little v squared so great now i have two equations two unknowns the bad news is I have to do some squaring. That's the price you pay to have an energy equation. It's great you have it, but now there's that square you have to go do. So that's 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 what makes this painful. All right. So let's write our two equations together. We have to we have to solve them simultaneously. All right. So I'm going to erase this stuff. All right, so I was able to apply conservation momentum as usual. And in this particular special case, I was able to apply the conservation of energy. So I end up having two equations, two unknowns. M v naught squared is big M big V squared plus M V squared. Oh, I'm sorry. No squares yet. Then I'm the one with the squares. M v naught squared is big M big V squared plus M V squared. So those are, this has been the conservation of momentum. This has been the conservation of energy. So now what do I do? Well, I'm going to, as I, as I always must, if I'm going to try to solve two equations, two unknowns, I have to set one equation equal to one unknown and then substitute to eliminate that variable. So I can just get one equation, one unknown, get one of the variables, and then plug it back in to get the second variable. Okay, so I'm I'm just gonna pick as my first one. I'm gonna take the momentum equation and solve for little v. Okay, that's all I'm gonna do. So I take this momentum equation, solve for little v. How do I do that? Well, I'm gonna take this term, subtract this whole term, and divide by little m. If I do that, I find I have little m v naught. I've subtracted the big M V and I'm dividing everything by little M. Just did a couple steps of algebra in one. Okay. And well, it turns out that I can write this as V is little M V naught over little M. Those cancel out minus big M over little M times big V. So I can actually rewrite this as little v as v naught minus big M over little m times big V. All I've done is I've, I've solved for little v in terms of big V. And what am I gonna do now? Well, as usual, I'm gonna now eliminate. I'm gonna take this expression and I'm basically going to substitute it in to the second equation, all right? so. I've solved the first equation for little v, and I'm now going to substitute it in for little v in the second equation. All right, so when I do that, I'm gonna see if I can write it over here. I'll get, eh, I'm gonna erase, so keep, keep an eye on that. Um, when I do that, I'll get one equation. So I'm erasing now for real estate purposes. All right, so that second equation is what? Well, it normally was m v naught squared is big M big V squared plus little m v squared, but now it's going to be m v naught squared equals big M big V squared plus little m times what? Times what I saw for before. So again, I'm plugging that that equation back in and I get, instead of V squared, I get V naught minus big M over little M times big V squared. All I did is I took that first equation and I solved it for V and I substituted it in and that's what I get. And that, the nasty thing I have to do now is I gotta square this out. 
all right? That's the not so pretty thing. But if you look, there's no more little V. It's gone. Now I go, I have to solve for big V, all right? So here we go. Little m v naught squared is big M, big V squared plus little m. I'm trying to make these uh, small m's and large m's and the v's, you know, kind of uh, distinctive if I possibly can to not add confusion. So we're, we're going to do FOIL. Got this v naught squared here. And you know you multiply these two terms together, multiply by 2. That's how FOIL works. So minus 2 big M over little m v naught big V. Then I square the last term. Plus big M squared big V squared over little m squared. All right, and um, I'm gonna, and I gotta do is I gotta multiply this little m through everywhere. So again, m v naught squared is big M big V squared. This little m times the first term is simply gonna be little uh, m v naught squared. Now this m multiplying the second term cancels out the m in the denominator there. So that just goes away. So I have I now have two big M V naught V. And then this M cancels out one of the M's in the denominator on that side. So now I have plus big M squared over little m to the first power now times big V squared. So again, I've I have squared out everything. And one of the things you hope is that something cancels on, yes, I have an mv not squared on one side and an mv squared not squared on the other side of the equation. So those nicely cancel. And so what I can do at this point is throw anything that depends on, well, actually I, I, can, I can factor out, let me, let's just kind of rewrite this a little bit here. And so um, I can actually see that, uh, every single term in this equation now has a capital V in it. So I can actually rewrite things. And this On the other side, this is zero. So I can actually write now is I have big V times what? Big M, big V. I took one V away. This term's gone. Minus two, big M, V naught. Okay? And... Um, and I have plus, I have another, in fact, I can pull out a big M as well if I want. So I can have a big M as well. So, uh, you know what, let's do one thing at a time. So big V. Um, and then on this other side, I, I took out one big V. So I have big M squared over little m times big V. All right, and that's equal to zero. I can actually fact, I can actually cancel out big V on both sides. So I can eliminate big V, I can cancel out big V. Uh, or one factor of big V. And that's the trivial solution. Or I'll say factor of big V. This would be the trivial solution. Trivial solution means, you know, that there's actually, in this equation, I have something times something equals zero. Well, I have two ways that can happen. Either, v, either the first term is zero and the second term is not, or the first term is not zero and the second term is zero. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the situation that I'm gonna cancel out and now, now what's left is that the second term is zero. So that extra big V doesn't matter anymore. So let's simplify things. Gonna go back to the top. And find out that, well, now what do I have? I, I now have what's left over is big M 
big V minus two, big M, little V naught, plus big M squared over little M times big V equals zero. And you'll, you'll and uh, yeah, verily, I can actually can I can actually factor out a capital M everywhere. So factored out capital M, I get big V minus two little v naught plus big M over little m times big V equals zero, and I can factor that out as well. That's gone. All right, moving on. Getting someplace. What's left? Well, I have big V minus two little v naught plus big M over little m times big V equals zero. Let's keep all the, what am I solving for? Big V, right? Let's keep all the big V's on the other side. Anything doesn't have it, on, you know, we'll throw it on, on, the, on the right side. So I have big V plus big M over little m times big V is 2V naught. I just threw 2V naught on the other side. And I can factor out big V now. So big V, and I now have one plus big M over little m equals 2V naught. Okay, and then the next thing I can do is I get a common denominator right here. I'm going to erase what's up here now. So a common denominator would be little m. How do I do that? Well, I'll just turn I'll turn this one into little m over little m. So big V times instead of one, I'll write in a suggestive form little m over little m plus big M over little m is two v naught, and then Again, once you have like terms, just like fractions, you add you add the fractions. So big V as a quantity, little m plus big M divided by little m is 2V naught. And finally, I can just multiply by the multiplicative inverse of each side. So I'll just multiply by the multiplicative inverse of each side of this. So again, I'll just write that I have little m over little m plus big M. I mean, I can multiply on either side of an algebraic equation by whatever I want, times V times little m plus big M over little m. And what I do to the left, I gotta do to the right. So two m v naught over little m plus big M. These cancel, and I finally get that the final velocity of the goalie is two, Mass of the puck, little m, initial uh, velocity of the puck, v naught, divided by the total mass of the system. That is the final velocity of the goalie. Okay, let's put that aside. That's important. So I'll put that aside for a moment. I'll save it. Important equation. So we know this relationship. All right, now what do I do? Well, remember I had two equations, two unknowns. So recall I substituted earlier with little v is equal to um, v naught um, minus two cap m v naught over little m plus big M from The momentum equation. So go back in your notes and remind yourself of that. When I had two, I had two equations, right? Two equations, two unknowns. I said, "All right, well, darn, I, I have one that's uh, momentum, one that's energy." And the problem is the energy has, you know, the energy of v squared. So I decided to eliminate little v. So I stuck, I, I, so I solved for little v from the momentum equation, and I substituted into the energy equation, right? Well, it turns out that, okay, so I got, I have this relationship. 
Well, why don't I just now go back now? Now that I know, uh, oops, uh, this is not right. Is it? Oh, sorry, this was actually maybe the. Sorry about that. Um, no. My brain is not working here. Um, that equation as it was actually this. I don't know what I was looking at. All right, so I went back. So my momentum equation, if you remember, we got this nice relationship, and I used that to sub substitute into the energy equation for the V squared. Well, it's nice that, okay, so remember, when you are doing two equations to unknowns, you will eliminate one variable, solve for it, but then what you can do is once you can solve for it, see, I can actually solve for this now. I know the mass of the puck. I know the initial velocity of the, of the puck. I know the mass. So I can actually get a number right now. Right now, I can get a number, okay? And I can actually now, what, we, what you then do is go to the, one of the two, one of the two original equations you pick and plug this value in to get you the other variable that you wanted to solve for. Well, I'm going to do that now because so I know everything on the right-hand side. So now I'm going to pick one of the two. I'll pick the momentum equation. Why not? That's the easier equation. It's already been solved for you because I had to do that in order to be able to do the substitution in the first place. So I'm just going to pick, basically take this relationship and stick it in here. So I'm going to now substitute right in here. And what do I get? I get V is V naught minus big M over little m times what's my big V? It's two little m v naught over little m plus big M. Turns out that those little masses cancel out. And so I have little v is v naught minus two big M v naught divided by little m plus big M. And I have to do the same game. I want to get a common denominator, right? So again, let's remind ourselves of this. I'm going to keep that on. I'm going to substitute again. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to erase again. So now I'm going to just do some algebra. So I have this, you know, fraction. I get a, a common denominator. Well, the common denominator will be, will be little m plus big M. So I'll take this and I'll say, okay, well, I have the naught, or V is V naught. I'm going to multiply by one, but in a very special form little m plus big M over little m plus big M. And then I have minus 2 big M v naught over little m plus big M. All I've done, all I'm doing is getting a common denominator, just like you did not uh, before, you know, high school or before you came here. Now I can just, I can simply just now uh, well, now I can I mean, clean things up. So little v is going to be little m v naught plus big M v naught minus 2 big M v naught all divided by little m plus big M. Again, you can, I mean, I just multiply the v naught through, distribute it. And so now, um, and again, I'm able to add because I have a common denominator, right? So now it's a matter of saying, okay, I have a common denominator. I'll notice here I have big M V naught minus two big M V naught. That's negative big M V naught, right? So I have V is little m V naught minus big M V naught divided by little m plus big M. And I can pull out a V naught. So I have finally, my final puck velocity is little m minus big M over little m plus big M. All of that is multiplied by the original puck velocity V naught. And there you go. That's the second formula that you need. So this is the formula that gives you the final velocity of the hockey goalie. This is the formula that gives you the final velocity of the hockey puck. Now we're ready to put in some numbers, all right? So going back to the hockey goalie, um, let's, uh, let's plug in its numbers. The 
big B. Two, what was the mass of the um, hockey puck again? It was 0 0.150 kilograms. Initial velocity was negative. Remember, we're still talking about velocities here. 35.0 meters per second. And then divide by the total mass, the 0 0.150 kilogram hockey puck plus the 70.0 kilogram goalie. So the final velocity of that goalie is going to be negative 0 0.15 meters per second. So big goalie is going to have a small final velocity. What about the hockey puck? Well, here B will be, let's remind ourselves of the equation is here. So we have B is little m plus big M over little m, sorry, little m minus big M over little m plus big M, all multiplied by V naught. All right, so. I have this, I have this relationship now. So negative 0.15 meters per second. So I'm going to do some erasing here, for conservation of real estate. So when I do all this, I find out that my big V, it's one of my answers I'm looking for, is negative 0 0.15 meters per second, or V is 0 0.15 meters per second in initial. direction of puck. Okay, uh, over here, what do I have? Well, final velocity of the puck. Again, hockey puck is, I'm sorry, it's gonna be uh, 0 0.150 kilograms minus 70 kilograms for the goalie divided by 0 0.150 kilograms plus 70 kilograms, again, for the goalie, multiplied by negative uh, 35 meters per second. I'm still on the, yeah. yeah. She's staying on the camera here, again. Okay, 0 0.150 kilograms minus 70 kilograms divided by 0 0.150 kilograms plus 70 kilograms multiplied by negative uh, 35.0 meters per second. So the final velocity of the hockey puck, when I do this, I'm trying to make this a little b, is equal to uh, 34.85 meters per second, um, and again, that's going to be indirect, in, uh, in opposite direction to its initial direction. I mean, the plus and minus sign say enough. So again, this is the puck, and over here is the goalie. All right, so again, I apply conservation of momentum, and fortunately, I was told that the, that the uh, problem was, um, was uh, an elastic collision, so I was able to apply conservation of energy. The problem with the conservation of energy is that you have these squares, which makes things more complicated mathematically. And again, we're only in one dimension. We're already getting mathematically complicated. All right. Now, next thing I want to talk about is uh, any elastic collisions in one dimension. So as you can imagine, any, an inelastic collision is one where the energy is not conserved, which is, in general, the case of most, if not all, collisions anyway. I mean, uh, you'll, idol, you'll idealize equations and problems in textbook problems as elastic, like you know what we just did, but is it really 
truly elastic? Well, the answer would be no. All right, so um, eight point. So I'm going to look at an inelastic collision. Okay, that's um, a collision in which energy conservation cannot be applied. Simple as that, all right? And again, the best way to apply these would be, I would say, um, doing a problem. So let's do a problem. I'm going to go to OpenStax 8.32. So now I cannot go and grab the conservation of energy and use it. If it says it's inelastic, I mean, the assumption is, unless you're told otherwise, the conservation of energy is not at your at, uh, uh, available to you to use unless you're explicitly told that the collision is elastic. You have to be explicitly told that or else you cannot use the conservation of energy. So I'm gonna look at OpenStax 8.32. Okay, that says um, during an ice show, A 60.0 kilogram skater uh, leaps into the air and is caught by an initially stationary 75 kilogram skater. Uh, A, what is their final velocity? Kind of a little bit like the uh, railroad cars bumping into each other, but more beautiful, obviously. Uh, what is their final velocity? Assuming negligible friction. And, and that the 60 kilogram skater uh, skaters original horizontal velocity Uh, is 4.00 meters per second. And B. How much kinetic energy is lost? Okay, um, 
During an ice show, a 60.0 kilogram skater leaps into the air and is caught by an initially stationary 75.0 kilogram skater. A. What is their final velocity, assuming that niggles will friction and that the 60 kilogram skater's original horizontal velocity is 4.00 meters per second? And B. How much kinetic energy is lost? This isn't sure. Hang on. Let me write this. I, I have half the words are like off the side here. Uh, all right. Let me rewrite this. Uh, all right. Again, during an ice show. Sixty kilogram skater leaps into the air and is caught. by an initially stationary 75 kilogram skater. Okay. Uh, A, again, sorry, all this. What is, uh, their final velocity, assuming um, negligible friction. And um, that the the sixty kilogram skater's original horizontal velocity is four point zero meters per second. And B, how much kinetic energy is lost? All right. Okay, again, during a nice show, a 60.0 kilogram skater leaps into the air and is caught by an initially stationary 75.0 kilogram skater. A, what is their final velocity, assuming negligible friction, that the 60.0 kilogram skater's original horizontal velocity is 4.00 meters per second? B, how much kinetic energy was is lost? All right. So again, sorry for the uh, issue of my camera. All right. So... Okay, um, so what do we do? Well, we have a, we only have conservation of energy. I'm sorry, momentum. It's an elastic, so there's no energy. Okay, um, so what do I do? Well, before, 
we say that, okay, we, we have to put a little laundry list of what our variables actually are. I'll call skater one, the one that's 60.0 kilograms. Skater one has initial velocity of 4.00 meters per second. Okay. And um, we're trying to make this a one-dimensional problem. That's why we're concerned with the initial skater going horizontally. M2 is 75.0 kilograms. And V2 was, initially the initial skater was stationary, so zero. Um, we want to find out their total block, total mass when they're together is M1 plus M2 or 135 kilograms. We're going to add up their masses here, kind of for simplicity. And we want to find out, well, what is their final velocity? Big V. All right, so before, the momentum um, is just going to be M1V1 plus M2V2. But V2 was zero, right? So the initial, the initial skater was zero after you just have P final is nothing more than the total mass times the total velocity. And so conservation of energy, or sorry, momentum, says that um, P sub I is P sub F, or M1 V1, is M V. And so what we can do now is I'll erase some of this up up here. It's always simplifies things when one of the uh, initial bodies is stationary. So I want to solve for big V. So what's it going to be? M1 V1 over big M. Big V is, I have the uh, 60 kilogram skater, 60.0 or 60 kilograms times 4.00 meters per second divided by 135 kilograms. And I find out that that final velocity of the two skating together will be V, big V is 1.78 meters per second in initial direction of, of the 60 kilogram skater. All right, so that's important to note because again, this is a uh, Momentum is a vector. All right, so now part B asks us to look at the conservation of energy. So let's remember some of these things. So um, final velocity is 1.78 meters seconds. Let's remember that. All right, so is energy? So, so how much energy? How much energy is lost? So let's look at energy. So kinetic energy initial. What was that? Well, that's going to be one half m1 v1 squared plus one half m2 v2 squared. But remember, the initial velocity of the uh, of the uh, skater two, the 75 kilogram skater, is uh, he uh, was zero because uh, it's, he's considered stationary. So the kinetic energy will be zero as well. That first term is just zero. So the initial kinetic energy is entirely going to be carried by the skater, the 60 kilogram skater who leaps and, and you know and is in motion. So one half the 60 kilograms times 4.00 0 
meters per second quantity squared. The kinetic energy initial, if you look, if you do this calculation, you'll find out that it is um, 480 joules. Kinetic energy final will be one half their total mass times the final velocity or final speed squared. Kinetic energy final will be one half, 135 kilograms times um, 1.78 meters per second squared. Final kinetic energy we'll see as 214 joules. So the loss so here we have the initial and the final. What's loss going to be? Well, the delta kinetic energy is going to be kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial. And again, the energies are just scalars, so they add. They just add. Delta kinetic energy. Is 214 joules minus 480 joules. Delta kinetic energy means that we have taken a loss of 266 joules. That's part B. All right. And now we've talked about elastic collisions and inelastic collisions in one dimension, we're going to generalize it now to two dimensions. I mean, quite frankly, it ought to be in, potentially in three dimensions, but we're going to go to two dimensions because it's the math is already going to get gnarly enough. So let's take a look now at collisions of, well, we're going to call them point masses for now. So collisions of point masses in two dimensions. And why I care about calling them point masses is I only want to consider, only want to consider translational motion. No, not rotational motion. You know, if you see car accidents, you oftentimes see that, you know, they, they collide together, but at the same time, you also see that it appears that one car kind of got rotated uh, by another car, right? We're going to, you know, there's, there's actually, we're going to find out in the next couple of chapters, there's actually energy associated with rotation. There's rotational kinetic energy as well. Right now, we're just going to consider point masses. So all we're really considering is like little billiard balls striking each other. We're going to consider point masses. That's why, you know, so we're not, we're not going to talk about anything more complicated like, like rotations. We're going to kind of consider like billiard balls for right now. Okay. So what is the picture that we want to look at in general? So I'm going to warn you right now, the math is going to become more involved. So I have a couple of bodies that are essentially going to be initially. Uh, let's just say I have a body over here with an initial vector this way. And I have another body that's coming in at some other initial velocity. So initial velocity. So the so again, there's I will say that this is gonna, I'll call this mass one. It's gonna have a P1I. We'll call it mass one, mass one P one I. So there's going to be an M one here, and it's going to be going at some. If I imagine a horizontal, understood horizontal, there's going to be an initial I would call theta one I. All right, so the mass is going to be going at some momentum P one I. I means initial again. 
Then I have another mass M2 up here. And it's going to have an initial momentum P2I. And let me write it down here, actually. Sorry, uh, P2I. And if you imagine, considering a horizontal, it would have theta 2I as its angle. Okay, now they're going to collide. Bang. They collide right here. That's where they collide. Afterwards, we have two new velocity vectors. Well, imagine that my mass of, again, this is still my mass two. I'll have a P2F going at some angle with the horizontal of theta 2F. And down here, I have a P1F going at some sort of a theta, theta 1F. And a bunch of variables happening here. So again, two masses, M1 and M2. And mass one has a P1I, has initial momentum, you know, label as one, I means initial, it's gonna be going with respect to the horizontal and a, at an angle theta one I. Mass two has a momentum P two I, and it's going at an angle theta two I with the, with, with the horizontal. Bang, they, 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 have, they have a collision. Afterwards, mass two is gonna have P two F, F meaning final, at an angle to horizontal theta two F. And this other one's gonna have a, a mass one's gonna have a P one F and an angle with the horizontal theta 1f. We want to specify this relationship in two dimensions. So what would you say? Well, in, in a vector equation, it would mean that P1i plus P2i equals P1f plus P2f. This is my vector relationship. And again, I have not in any way, uh, this is a vector equation, because momentum is a vector equation, I have not in any way committed myself to any kind of a coordinate system. But if I were to say that, well, I will say that, that this is, let me say that I have a coordinate system, plus x, minus x, plus y, and minus y. Now I can write the following. Because every vector equation is equivalent to one or more scalar equations. I can write P1ix plus P2ix, x component. And again, the, this equation has to be true for each coordinate p1 f x plus p2 f x likewise p1 i y plus p2 i y equals p1 f y plus p2 F, Y. All I'm saying is that these components, the constant initial momentum, must be true in each coordinate. So P1I in the X direction plus P2I in the X direction equals P1F in the X direction plus P2F in the X direction. P1I in the Y direction plus P2I in the Y direction equals P1F in the Y direction plus P2F in the Y direction. So each component, this is the general vector equation, this is the component equation. Now, how do I write these components? Remember, x component means cosine. If this is gonna be you know, your, um, your hypotenuse, if you will, 
cosine is going to give you the x component. The opposite will be sine, right? And so putting it all together, and erase this picture here, is I can write the most general conservation of momentum equations in each component. I can always start my problems this way. So I could say instead of P1I, I can say, well, what is what is what is uh, P1? Well, it'll be M1 B1. Uh, I'm going to need to get as much space as possible. <clears throat> M1 B1I cosine theta 1I. Okay. Again, I'm looking at the X equation right now. The X component equation. Okay. That's for P1 plus M1. Oh, sorry. You got to do M2 now. M2 B2I uh, cosine theta 2I is equal to M1 V1F cosine theta 1F plus M2 V2F cosine theta 2F. That's the equation. So all I said was P1IX, that's P1I in the, in the X component. So P1 is M1V1I, that's P1I, times what? Cosine of theta 1I, it's at an angle theta 1I with the horizontal, plus P2IX, M2V2I, mass times velocity, times cosine of theta 2I, gets you the component, equals P1FX, M1V1F, cosine theta 1F, plus M2V2F, cosine theta 2F. All I've written is this first equation. This is just equating the components. Your P1I is going to be your M1V1I. The X component is going to be the cosine. Your P2I, M1, M2V2I. X component is going to be that angle. Cosine of theta 2i. P1fx, that's M1v1f, that's the mass times velocity, times the cosine of theta 1f. And then P2fx is M2v2f, again, mass times velocity, times the cosine of theta 2f. And that's the most general form of the x component equation. As you can imagine, the y component equation looks very similar, except I will replace all the cosines with sines. So in the y component, I would write M1 V1I sine of theta 1I plus M2 V2I sine of theta 2I equals M1 V1F sine of theta 1F plus M2 V2F sine of theta 2f. Again, all I've done is replace all the cosines with sines. All right, and so it looks nasty, but again, all I've done is I've rewritten this in terms of the components. These are the most general momentum conservation equations you can have in two dimensions. Okay, so the above, these are these are the most general um, momentum conservation equation in two dimensions. Generally, when you start a problem that deals with the conservation of momentum, you will um, you will essentially start off. I mean, I don't care if you're in this class or university physics or in an advanced uh, mechanics class. You're going to start off with this as your most general equation. All right, so let's let's um, do a problem to kind of uh, I'm going to kind of finish things off by just doing a problem that 
solidify everything. So I'm going to look at problem 8.45. Again, momentum conservation is a simple concept, but the math gets gnarly. All right. So I'm going to finish the problem up, you know, by uh, looking at 8.45. So 8.45 from OpenStax says the following. So OpenStax 8.45. says uh, two identical pucks collide on an air hockey table One puck was originally at rest. A, if the incoming puck has a speed. Has a speed. Uh, 6.00 meters per second <clears throat> and scatters at an angle of 30.0 degrees. <clears throat> what is the velocity? Magnitude and direction of the second puck. Confirm that the collision was elastic. Now, um, they give one, uh, well, let's just, let's, oh, I'll talk about that in a moment. So here's the two identical pucks collide on an air hockey table. One puck was originally at rest. A, if the incoming, ha if incoming puck. Uh, has a speed of 6.00 meters per second and scatters at an angle of 30.0 degrees. What is the velocity, magnitude, and direction of the second puck? And then be confirmed that the collision was elastic. All right, so I will, I'm going to make a, an assumption in a moment that help with the whole elastic uh, business. So anyway, let me erase this. All right, so um, we go back to the general form of the equations. We have a conservation of momentum problem in two dimensions. Let's go back to the most general form of the equation. So again, they're ugly, but again, we'll, we'll go from there and we'll start simplifying. So again, M1, V1, I, cosine theta, 1, I plus M2 times V2I 
times the cosine of theta 2i equals m1 v1 f cosine of theta 1 f plus m2 v2 f cosine of theta 2 f. That's one equation. The other equation, m1 v1 i times the sine of theta 1 i plus m2 v2 i times the sine of theta 2 i equals m1 v1 f times the sine of theta 1 f plus m2 v2 f times the sine of theta 2 f. All right. Those are the most general, admittedly ugly um, equations. Now, what do you do? Well, you start simplifying. So what are we told? We're told that one of the pucks is initially at rest. Okay, great. That means one of the pucks is initially at rest, and that means that V2I is zero. Great, that simplifies things a little bit. We're also told that V1I is 6.00 meters per second. We're told that as well. Good, that's a number. Theta 1 F. Well, theta 1 F, we're told, is a scattering angle of 30 degrees. 30 degrees from what? Well, we are free to set an initial, we are, we are free to set whatever coordinate system we want. Why not make the x coordinate of the system? aligned with the initial direction of the incoming puck. So let's let theta 1i equal zero. We're free to do that. So we're setting, we are setting x-axis uh, to align with initial direction. of moving puck. We'll say initially moving puck. All right? And so, and we can also, we also know, well, let's just kind of simplify things already. So if that's the case, if we know this information, I want to erase this information here for real estate purposes, but let's kind of remember what I'm doing here, okay? So I gotta go back to my initial two equations. There they are. Okay, so let's let's visit them. Theta one i. I just said that was zero. Oh, one more thing. One more thing is that assume pucks are identical. This means, so M1 equals M2. All masses cancel. That also simplifies the problem, doesn't it? So let's apply those simplifications. So at this point, as a first simplification, is we have no masses. So we go back and just cancel out all the masses. Already, we are simplifying things. But I mean, I can't always do this, but I can do it here. And honestly, I generally don't like you throwing very, uh, values of variables in early, but in the case of this conservational momentum, it's okay because it gets really nasty. Now, so V1i, I said it was six. Let's kind of rewrite this. V1i, 6.00 meters per second. Cosine, what did I say theta one i was? I said the theta one i. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna set the the coordinate systems up such that the x coordinate is aligned with the initial direction of of, of mass one. So theta one i is zero. So it's gonna be cosine of zero. Great. B two i. Well, the initial uh, the puck, the, the puck number two was initially at rest. So that's zero. 
and kind of and I kind of don't care what those sine theta two i is. It doesn't really matter. This so this whole second term is just zero. It's not moving. Zero equals. Well, let's see. B one f. Well, B one f. I um I don't know what that is because what am I being asked? I'm being asked um. I want the velocity of the second puck. Yeah. So I'm gonna get the velocities of both the pucks here. So anyway, I don't know, I don't I do not know what B1F is. And cosine, I was told that theta one f is gonna be going scattering at a 30 degree angle. And I also don't know what um, theta uh, 2f is yet, but I will uh, talk about that in a moment. I don't know b2f, and there's a cosine of theta 2f. I don't know that yet, but hang on. Okay, now that's the first equation. Second equation, b1i, again, is 6.00. Sine of zero, because theta one i is zero, plus again the the initial puck is not moving, so this whole second term is zero, and that's going to equal what? B one f I don't know. Sine of thirty degrees, that's that scattering angle, plus v two f. Again, I don't know v two f either. And that's going to be the sine of theta 2f. All right. So it really gets down to a simplification right off the bat from what I, what I originally had. Okay, I'm going to erase this. All I've done is I've taken the most general equations and I simplified. All right, so now what do I have? Well, I want to make one more assumption here is that there's actually a hint uh, given um, in the uh, problem. And the hint is if a collision is elastic, then the objects uh, scatter at 90 degrees to each other. Okay, this is a special case here. So that's the case that means that if this is my x coordinate, and let's just say for instance that my my mass one was going this way, you know, my B1i, and I said that my B 2i was at 30 degrees. Oops. Well, 90 degrees would mean that my V2, I'm oh, sorry, my V2f, I'm oh, sorry, my V1f, sorry about that. So my V2f would have to come out, these two have to add together. So it would come out at negative 60 degrees. V 2f. That's the hint that I get. All right. And so, so what I can now do is I can now say that from that, and this has to be a 90 degree angle, right? So from that particular hint, I can then say that theta 2f is negative 60 degrees. All right. And so what I can actually now do is say that these are now negative 60 degrees. And same with this. All right. So simplify my equation little by little. All right. So let's uh, see what that gives us. All right, cosine of zero is one. 
So top equation, 6.0 times cos zero, that just gives me 6.00 plus zero, okay, is V1F cosine of 30 plus V2F cosine of negative 60. All right, this one, 6.0 times the sine of zero. Sine of zero is zero. So zero plus zero, the le left-hand side of my second equation, my y equation is just zero. Well, that's nice. That's equal to V1F sine of 30 degrees plus V2F sine of negative 60 degrees. All right, so I have my, na my original very nasty looking equations, but now they have simplified. All right, and so I know there's some nice trigonometry here. I know that, again, the cosine of 30 degrees is the square root of three over two. So I can, I can so I'll, what I can do is I can write that V1F, Cosine of 30 is the square root of 3 over 2. Oh, actually, before I say this, we have a symmetry relationship. Remember from trigonometry, sine is an odd function. That means that the sine of negative theta is negative sine of theta. Okay, so what, what does that mean? Well, if I look at the sine function on either side of zero, remember what it looks like. Looks like, you know, like this, but if I go through zero, it's odd. That means if I take a look, if I, go, if I look at, say, some sort of an x on one side, it's going to give me the negative value on the other side. If I go to x on either side, I get exactly the opposite value. So sine of negative theta is negative sine of theta. The mirror is the negative, essentially. So if I go a little bit x over, I'll notice that the on the other side, the function has its negative value on the other side. We call that an odd function. Okay? The cosine is an even function. And this is knowledge from trigonometry. What that says is that the cosine of negative theta is the cosine of theta. If I look at the cosine, remember the cosine looks like it starts, cosine of zero is one. It starts at the top. So if I go some amount x over, I notice that and I go the same amount x on the other side, I'll notice that the function is the same. It's mirrored about the y-axis. Okay? And so, with that said, I can actually say that the cosine of negative 60 is the cosine of 60, and the sine of negative 60 is negative sine of 60. So I can rewrite these equations one more time. 6.00 equals V1F cosine of 30 degrees plus V2F cosine of 60 degrees because the cosine is an even function. So the cosine of negative 60 is the same as the cosine of 60. The second equation, 0 equals V1F sine of 60 degrees minus V2F sine of 60 degrees. Actually, this is uh, 30 degrees here. All right, and so now I can I uh, I can say that once it's 6.00 equals, well, see, cosine of 30 is the square root of 3 over 2. So I have the square root of 3 over 2 times V1F. 
cosine of 60 is a half plus V2F divided by 2. And on the second one, I have 0 is V1F. Sine of 30 is now 1 half. 